In 2013, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and IGRO SDSU Extension for delivering the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. A series of four local events were held in South Dakota in Sioux Falls, Watertown, Belfouche, and Mitchell. I have a hard time remembering names, uh, not because I graduated from South Dakota State. But <laughs> and I did that in uh, 1972, and, and I started to work at South Dakota State in uh, uh, August of 61. So, let's see, 2014, that's a 53rd year I'm starting my career. So, it's been fun, and these new things, and what Mike just talked about, holy cow, I hope I can supplement a little bit to what, what he's been saying. And, and the soil health score is what we're talking about today. And, and what I've done is using Rick Haney's slides, kind of his information, to talk about this uh, soil health score. So uh, just to give uh, account to him and the handout that's in your uh, pamphlet or in your book uh, is from Rick Haney, written by Rick Haney. And, and uh, so we're trying to follow these things as we go along. And, and just talk about some of those things. So nature's way, uh, you know, that's kind of, we're trying to get back to somewhat like Mother Nature did things. And they grow a skin on, as a, it grows a skin for a living system, cycles nutrients, diverse, no monoculture, seeks a balance, integrated, has research and development experience, and builds plant, plant root networks. And, uh, and it show this soil up here in the granular structure. And one of the simplest things that we can remember on our operation is look at the soil structure. And we don't talk about, I don't think we talk about that quite enough. You need to be out looking at your soil. And if you pick soil up and it's, it's got the organic matter in there and, and all the pores, all the, uh, it, it might be you'll see a mold, kind of, kind of white stuff. You know you got a living thing or you got a worm in that little sample. All those things are what you need to look for. And, and this is, you know, where we come from. Why do we do it? It says strip off the skin, soil skin. And, you know, these things, that's where I grew up. That's what we did. And my dad had plowed the ditches shut so he'd combine wheat, you know, down southeast Nebraska. And, and so we just had a lot of that. Maybe not so much of this, this kind of thing here. But I see these pictures up in California this year on where all the, the dams are drying up and, and you see that kind of a crusting thing. So uh, destroys organic matter, increased erosion, increased inputs, wastewater, disrupt root networks. And so you know, as an example of what we did to the soil, in, uh, in, I got a soil survey of Saline County, Nebraska, 1932, published. In 1879, the average soil yield was 40 bushel. In 1889, it was 47 bushel. And in 1889, they had planted 140,000 acres of corn in Saline County, which is a county 50 miles south of Lincoln. And, and then I graduated high school in 1955, and the average dryland corn yield in Saline County in 1955 was nine bushel. That was with hybrid corn. The 47 bushel was with open pollinated corn. And, and you can relate, get your, to grandpas and of how we deteriorated the soils. And it's strictly a, a losing soil by erosion and doing tillage to get the nutrients out of the organic matter. And as we take nutrients out of the organic matter, we would destroy that organic matter. And we're, we beat the heck out of the soil for 70, 80 years, and we ended up there in, in 1956. I started college, started to learn that you could put nitrogen on, and so these inputs come in, and, and uh, we started getting the farmers to put fertilizer on, and the crops yields come back up. And then, and then we finally figured out that if we would stop beating the heck out of the soil, we could improve yields more, and maybe reduce our input costs. And, and this just shows that, that kind of thing. And Rick has this example. He says, it's your great, 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 great father's technology, a plow. And so uh, today, why? He says, why do we still do that? You know, we're driving down the highway, and I get scolded a lot because I do too much farming anyway while I'm driving. And, but <laughs> once in a while, she say, don't look when she sees this. <laughs> 
But I just, I just don't understand that. And, and uh, it, well, what, because you, you guys are you're doing this kind of thing and understand these things. And so if our, our ancestors didn't have a good planting system to plant directly into the soil, and so that's why tillage was done. But, uh, you know, uh, if we had that, you know, what would, would have been different today? And the only thing I don't like about that picture, he's got the uh, tilled soil on both sides of that drill, but, uh, you know, we, would we use that? So what can we do about this thing? And that's what we're talking about, is how do we improve the soil, soil health or soil quality? And he's got here, we plant cover crops, and we try no-till, and then we increase nutrient cycling, and with the cover crops, is what you're really doing is increasing nutrient cycling, and then that increases water conservation, and that increases organic matter. This is kind of the story that we're after. And, and in a, a corn-soybean rotation, sometimes it's difficult to think, how can you get a cover crop established in that? And you know, one thing that Mike just said, with those oats and the amount of mycorrhiza that that oats produced, I think maybe we ought to stop thinking about what did we do after harvest in the fall, and maybe start thinking about what could we do in the spring before we plant corn or soybeans. And I think we might be missing, missing uh, something there. So, so we, we have a long ways to go to understand all, how to do all these things. And if you've got wheat in the rotation, well, it's, it's kind of easy to plant a cover crop into the, into the wheat stubble, but some of these other things are more difficult. So harvest the light, of course, that's what, that's what we're about. And, and when we have tours in our laboratory of Kearney, uh, you know, ask, ask students. I, I like to ask the students these dumb questions. And, like, what did you eat for breakfast or what did you eat for lunch? And, and it goes right back to this photosynthesis thing. Uh, all we really ate was, was sunlight. We got the energy from the sunlight and the plants converted it so we could use it. And uh, so then I tell some guys that if you come home a little tipsy at night, just say you've been drinking sunlight. <laughs> Not moonshine, sunlight. So, uh, uh, Conserve soil moisture with transpiration and not evaporation. And this is the other, the other thing that we're dryland agriculture. We, we get precipitation goes in here and then evaporation. How do we stop this? And, and uh, most of the guys say 30% of the evapotranspiration water, 30% of that's evaporation. And, and, and all we have to do is put this, cover this soil, and the better cover we got on it, the more we can slow that evaporation. So when we get cover there, to stop the evaporation, we got a chance to grow better crops. This tomato thing here uh, on the leaf surface, that's what opens to let carbon monoxide in the leaf. And when that's open, what goes out of the leaf? Water. So if we can have more uh, cover here that's giving off CO2, then these stomata don't have to open as far. And we actually have a little better water uh, use. Uh, you know, it takes less transpiration water if we got more CO2 in the, in the uh, atmosphere. So Jerry Hetfield at Ames, he says that in Iowa, he's got these, these meters, the carbon dioxide meters around the state of Iowa. And after corn harvest in the fall, this carbon dioxide level increases 40 to 60 part per million because the Iowa farmers are doing tillage. That's, that's carbon dioxide for the plants the next summer. And, and we don't talk enough about the carbon plant nutrient, but 40% of the plant is carbon. And if we could have that carbon being released while the plants are growing. So I asked Jerry, he was down in Burlington last week in Colorado, and, and I said, Jerry, what does what it drop to in the summertime when the corn's growing? And he says, uh, it actually goes down, it's 390 parts per million, it goes down to 290 parts per million above those corn canopies that the plant's sucking that much carbon dioxide in. So if we had more, more stuff laying here on the surface to decompose next summer when the crop is growing, uh, maybe we can increase yields that way too. And we can grow our soil fertility with cover crops and the, the thing we grow here is, as those are legumes, so we're growing nitrogen. And we have some cover crops that maybe will dissolve more phosphorus, but if we got the cover crops that have the mycorrhiza, the mycorrhizae is able to dissolve or take in phosphorus that, that the plant roots can't take in themselves. So, 
So you need these kind of cover crops. And here's a, another picture of the mycorrhiza root system. These, these things here, uh, those little narrow bands going out of root hairs, then increase the absorption. But then these mycelium are on there, uh, and that's what picks up those nutrients. That's a, a, a good example that Mike had. Christine Nichols uh, up at Bismarck told us that, that uh, one gram of soil contains 100 meters of this mycelium, this little fine stuff. And, and, uh, and uh, first of all, I ask her, how in the hell do you know that? You know, just, <laughs> and, uh, and 100 meters is the length of a football field. And that's in one gram of soil, one three-eighths of an inch cube of soil. It's just hard, to, hard to, for us to imagine what's going on, and so we have to you know, just develop those rotations to do that kind of thing, the root system shown there. And so the traditional soil test, and this is getting down to this soil health now, Rick says these are NPK, and I follow him a little bit because we do a lot more. We need, our, we need sulfur, we need zinc, and we need a couple other things. So he's using NPK, soil pH, present organic matter, and then we make recommendations. He says, where's the biology? And of course, that's what Mike just talked about and what we're, what we're trying to measure here also. And so uh, nitrogen, well, we use nitrate in our lab. And we, we take, subtract the nitrate from nitrogen requirement and make a recommendation. The soil health test, we do ammonium and nitrate. And then this is water extractable total nitrogen. Sovita is a CO2, a carbon CO2 burst test that is a 24 hour test. You have organic nitrogen and then organic carbon nitrogen ratio. And these here, when you talk about this, is water extractable. It's not the total nitrogen or total carbon in the soil, it's what's water soluble. And then he has this MAC Weon. I really like some of these terms he has. Mic microbe activity, uh, mic mic microbe active carbon, water extractable organic nitrogen. And then nitrogen mineralization here. And, and so we're looking at the water soluble carbon and nitrogen. And then we're doing some other things with, with phosphate. Uh, we have ICP phosphate and PO4 phosphate. He says there's seven different extracts here that for current labs. And, and Malik and Bray and Olson are the three that we know here. And then uh, over here we have ICAP P and PO4. And Rick, Rick calls ICAP phosphorus, he does this extra extract. And if you run through an ICAP or ICP, he calls that total P. Well, it's just what's in that sample that's organic and inorganic in that extract, but we had a lot more phosphorus than, the, than total P that he calls it. And this is the phosphate ion he calls it. And those are just the, the phosphate ions that are available to the plant. And we measure those with a colometric test, where the other ones with, a, with inductively coupled arg, uh, argon plasma. And then H3A uh, is the extract that he does this stuff with. Mimics plant root exudates. Remember when Rick was talking about the plant roots leaking stuff out? And, and, and Rick has said that there's about, he studied this 90 different compounds that plant roots will exude. And, and we're finding out that the, what the plant, if plant's short of a nutrient or something, or it's got some kind of stress, it exudes out a compound and expects somebody or one of those microbes to come help it. And so the compounds uh, attract different microbes. But he's used uh, three, three different extracts on this H3A, and I have a slide that shows that a little bit later, but there, there are three of the plant exudates that he said are very important in all plants, and that's what we use it. Then he's got sovita, the organic carbon nitrogen ratio, phosphorus mineralization, some of those things down there, but... Uh, so we, we can say, uh, soil test in nature's image, we can change our thinking, and, and for for me, that's, uh, that's kind of tough to do that. Uh, we can include soil biology. Henry, do you have that problem of, of changing your mind and some of those, or does that fit all the time? Uh, common soil testing methods are outdated and too focused on highly buffered chemical analysis. He's talking about me, and he says uh, what we're doing in our laboratories. And, and uh, then current methods do not reflect the complex elegance of the natural system, which is driven by organic carbon in the presence of water. And this is what, all of what Mike kind of talked about, this is what he's talking about. So fertility is not about single molecules. 
Nitrogen is about inorganic and organic nitrogen. Nitrate does not represent hundreds of nitrogen compounds that exist in soil water. And so, so we can extract those in that soil water extract and uh, measure uh, organic, or, organic nitrogen, which is what he's talking about there. So a soil health tool measures soil health by asking that our soil is the right questions. What is your condition? And you can see it with a spade, I mean with a spade, if and you know me, I carry that spade all summer with me, and I like to, like to just dig in that soil to see what its condition is. You can see a lot from just that. Are you in balance? What do you got out of whack? And what can we do to help? And, and this, and the balance here, if we want to increase organic matter, improve our soil health, we have to have all those kind of plant nutrients there because the organic matter is made up with all those plant nutrients in it. And we have to have, the, have pretty good fertility to get there. And this is just a diagram that unlocked the secrets. Two million pounds of soil in six inches, 40,000 pounds of carbon, 4,000 pounds of organic nitrogen, 2,000 pounds of organic phosphorus, and 100 or 1,000 pounds of microbes. And these are the real little things. And, and normally, I, I think there's a lot more than, than 1,000 pounds of microbes in our soils, but this is kind of what he depicts here. But, but these things are all the carbon and the nitrogen and the phosphorus. Well, and all the other nutrients, most of it's tied up there in the in organic matter. So uh, the new soil testing method, this is our routine test here. Then we've got soil organic nitrogen and, and phosphorus, microbial activity, water extractable carbon, and carbon nitrogen balance. And it goes through here to get the result. And, and the first one is microbial activity. Uh, go, go here, and it shows pictures of the microbes. We've seen those in that. One, one million to 10, 10 million per gram of soil. Uh, and that's a microbial activity. I think Mike said a billion, didn't he? He said more than the population. And, and uh, so, so that, but it's just lots of those things. And, and it, to me, it's a little bit hard to visualize all these things. It, I wish we could see those, if we could see them. But I was up at uh, Miles City, Montana, <laughs> in uh, November, and after we got through with the talks, and I was trying to get out of there because I wanted to head toward Rapid, but uh, the farmer come to me and said, hey, come over to my computer, I wanna show you something. And he had a microscope that he got in eBay that he hooked up to his computer, and he had these water uh, extracts, had a whole bunch of pictures of microbes. And what he wanted me to do was tell him which was a, which was a clay particle, and which was an organism, and we saw nematodes, and you can see the fuzz on the nematodes, the fun, fungi killing the, the nematodes and some of those things. And, and he said, I got, I got one, a no, new one ordered that measures a lot more magnification. And, and so here's a guy that's a hobbyist, uh, didn't know what he's looking at, but he had the, had the pictures. And he wanted me to identify him. Well, you got the wrong guy on the microbes. <laughs> you know, I, and I don't know how much time I got if I take too much, but. The reason, you know, the mi microbiology, I took a soil or a microbe class in college, an undergraduate, and uh, it was right after lunch. And this done stuff, and, and, and I, I just finally just stretched back and closed my eyes. When I woke up, of course, the instructor was talking to me and everybody was looking at me, but that's how I appreciated microbes in those days. You know? <laughs> and, and so it's just interesting to learn all these things. So here, of soil biology, complex integrated living system. You got oxygen over here, and uh, then organic carbon. It's a water soluble organic carbon, microbial population, and it gives off CO2. And, and I put this in here. Uh, soil microbes take in oxygen, rela release carbon dioxide, just like us. And so that soil structure that you have in that soil has to be there so that you can get air to go in as water goes out and for air to go out as water goes in. And so when we have really good, good structure, we have a lot better uh, air intake and outflow to keep the oxygen there for the microbes that keep growing and doing all those things that uh, we want it to do. Here's another picture of kind of saying the same. Here's fertilizers and manures that we put on. Here's organic compounds in the soil. And all this is fed to the microbes. And then, then the microbes release the nitrogen and phosphate to the plant. 
the microbes release the CO2. So that I want this CO2 really to be released when we got crap canopy out there as much as, and then we have to have good soil structure so we can bring oxygen in and water in to that system. And, and that's what it's all about. But the soil structure is, to, to really get that going good, you have to have good soil structure to get that airflow. Uh, here's an example of a, some research. Rick had a whole bunch of things in there and I just took this one because the Solvita test is a, is a test that we do. We wet the soil, put a, a CO2 panel in, in the jar, seal the lid, and then 24 hours later we measure the amount of CO2. And the, the researchers found that the, when you wet the soil, you get a tremendous release of carbon dioxide within the first 24 hours. And then they're following this out, out here, and then tapers off and continues on out for many days. But, but uh, Will Brighton you know, with uh, Woods End Laboratories up in, up in Maine and Rick developed this uh, Solvita test to measure that CO2 after, after 24 hours. And that's what this Solvita test is. Uh, here's a paddle in this jar and, and the microbe shown there. And then this, this reader reads that amount of carbon dioxide that's in there. And that's what we do in, that, in this soil test. And, and the first things that really develop are bacteria. They're, they're the smallest, and so they can uh, develop that real fast. Water-soluble carbon, extractable carbon. Uh, Rick says, I think he got a picture here. Uh, the soil organic matter is a house. Microbes live in. And water extractable organic carbon is the food they eat. And that, so that's what we're, what we're doing with this uh, Haney test. Is here's, here's a house with 2% two, uh, 2 organic matter. And the food is this, what's in solution in this soil that the microbes can use. So, uh, and that usually is from 1,000 to, I mean 100 to 300 parts per million in that water extract. And this is a microbial food. And it just shows here uh, the soil microbial activity. Uh, here in Maine, we have, you know, the soil is 6.4% organic matter, but its activity is less than in Wyoming where the, it's 6% organic matter, but the, the activity is a lot higher. And so it's, it also is based on the you know, locations and soil types. And then here, this Texas 1% organic matter, you have less soil microbial activity. I think that's pretty easy to understand. You should have those differences. And then we look at uh, soil nitrate and organic, soil organic nitrogen, which again is a water soluble stuff. And, and um, we've been missing half the plant available nitrogen. And this in 4,100 samples, he's found, and this is average, 42 pounds of available nitrate and ammonium and 37 pounds of organic nitrogen. And so in, in a, lot of the, a lot of the tests that we run, I see that all the time. They're about half and half. And, and then uh, this, uh, the Haney test estimates how much of that organic nitrogen is going to be available. Oh, I back up here. This is a, a thought process here. If plants could take up if plants could not take up organic compounds, herbicides would not work. And that's uh, Rick's wife that says that. But, you know, because we always told you guys that it's just nitrate and ammonium, PO4 ions and, and K, and, and now we're kind of finding out that maybe the plants can take up some other, other compounds or other organic uh, uh, nitrogen uh, compounds. And, and uh, that's a thought process that that is used to, to get at that. And then the carbon nitrogen balance, uh, uh, and so the organic carbon versus organic nitrogen in that water extract. In a high carbon nitrogen ratio greater than 20 to one, uh, calculates that no N or P mineralization is gonna happen in that soil that year. That's kind of his, the way he says that. As the carbon nitrogen ratio is lowered, nitrogen and phosphorus mineralization increases but is dependent on soil microbial activity, which I think uh, we've kind of, kind of stressed this. And then the soil health calculation is kind of what the, the title is here. Uh, overall health of your soil system continue, combine several independent measurements of your soil's biological and chemical properties. Varies from, over, from one to over 50. I, I, I've seen a couple up at about 20 so far. Track the effects of your management practices over years. 
and used to calculate cover crop input. So, so Rick, Rick wants this test to be used, uh, take the samples now, or you know, uh, for after harvest for planting for your next crop, and and uh, then then use uh, the the score to determine uh, how what kind of cover crop you should have. And so, I think I got I got a uh, calculation, and the calculation is is not too bad. The Sovita CO2 test is divided by the water extractable carbon nitrogen ratio. And then we add organic carbon, the water soluble organic carbon, divided by 100, and organic nitrogen divided by 10. So here we have a Solvita test of 70, divided by a carbon nitrogen ratio of 15, plus 500 is like organic carbon, divided by 130, organic nitrogen divided by 10. And so here's a 4.67 plus 5 plus 3 equals 12.7, which he says above 7 is, is on the right way. And I just used numbers so you get this good, good number. And we do not see very many of these in the samples that we've been running. And, the ones, and, and, and that's on our farm down in Sling County. I have a hard time. Uh, and, and, and Beck would, or Dwayne would say that I've been using too much phosphorus fertilizer. <laughs> so, uh, soil test integration and the Solvita one day test here and the extractable carbon and the percent microbial activity, extractable nitrogen, inorganic nitrogen, phosphorus, organic uh, carbon nitrogen ratio. And this one here he really doesn't use in the, in the test. Just how, how we do that Solvita test, then we, we get soil samples in and, and oh yeah, you take. You take your zero to six, just like you would for fertility tests. Take and and uh, you do, I would say ten to fifteen cores, hoping you'll do at least ten cores for a composite sample. <laughs> and, and it'd be better if you did fifteen. And then we we bring those in and we dry them, and, and then then we grind them. And so we have this ground salt. So these happen to be Texas. Uh, we were down to Rick's lab and take, took this picture, but. Uh, 40 grams of soil in these cups, and the cups are, have holes drilled in the bottom, and there's a filter paper so the soil won't go through the holes. And then we, in these jars, we have water poured in the bottom of these, and so when you put the, the soil in there, the, the soil wicks up for capillary movement and wets the soil, and then we put, a, put the paddle in, and then put a lid on the jar, and then come back in 24 hours and measure that. And, and here's uh, showing the, how this has changed from this, this color here to this color here. And you notice I say this color. One of those stories that everybody's got career stories, but I was going, I, I majored in soil concentration at the University of Nebraska. Got my degree in 1959, but I uh, had to go, I got lined up to go to work in Washington County, Nebraska as a working conservationist, had to go take a physical. So I went down to, to my hometown, February, Nebraska, and the doctor, and he pulled out a book about so thick and started flipping charts, and I was supposed to identify objects on those charts. And then I took my physical back up to the Saw Conservation Service NRCS person, and he asked me what the color in the wall was, what the colors were in the painting, and you know, I didn't know what the hell they were. And, uh, then hire me because I was colorblind. So, and I tell people that's the best thing the government ever did for me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, NRCS people, ARS people. <laughs> so, so the other part of the Haney test, so we talked about two parts, the Sylvita test and the water extractable test. And now we have the H3A test. And at H3A, everybody names a test after themselves. Bray, Maley, Olson. And so this is Haney, Haney, Hosner, and Arnold is what H3A stands for. And it's a water and a complex mixture of plant root exudates along with microbial derived enzymes. Below ground root system flows with elegance and complexity. We extract the soil with highly disruptive acidic or alkali solutions and call it plant available nutrients. He's He's uh, after me again in what we're doing in our soil testing. So I really don't think we're as bad as what, what he says here. So the, the water-soluble Haney, Haney test, uh, 
We just extract with DI water, distilled water, four grams of soil and 40 mils of water, shake for 10 minutes, centrifuge for five minutes, filter, and then we analyze for nitrate, ammonium, organic carbon, and total nitrogen, or the analysis you do on that water soluble extract. And then the H3A test is where Rick has taken these three organic compounds that roots exude out to, for, the, for the microbes to bring nutrients to the roots. And it's an organic acid, excellent food for microbes. And the, the, the acid drops the pH down to, he says, about two units less than what your pH is. So it kind of tracks with the soil pH uh, in doing that. But the malic acid, 1.2 grams, oxalic, 0.6 grams, citric acid, one gram, and then it's buffered with lithium citrate. It's kind of interesting that he says some of that on that other side, the buffer solution here, but he has to do that. But 1.2 grams in 2L, that's two liters, so that's 1.2 grams in 2,000 grams of water. So it's a pretty dilute solution. And then 0.6 gram per 2,000 uh, grams of water. And so that's the extract that, uh, that we use. And he, he puts them in uh, centrifuge tubes like this. We, we add the soil to an uh, Erlenmeyer flask and then add our extracting solution, either, either water or the H3A, and then we uh, shake that for uh, 10 minutes. And this is a centrifuge here, and, and we, got, we got one that holds 40 samples at a time. So we can do 20 water extracts and 20 H3A uh, samples at one time. Uh, we have to centrifuge them, and so we're handling every sample individually. In, in the laboratory, most of the stuff that we do in our normal test, we pick up a tray and it has 30 samples in it. So we're, we're doing a lot of things at one time, and in our lab in November, we run 3,700 samples a day on regular soil tests. And I think Lance thinks that we can do about 200 of these a day until we have to just get more, more equipment, of course. <laughs> and this is a, a torch, we call it, uh, and the samples are up here in these tubes, you know, kind of auto sampler. It measures the total organic carbon and total nitrogen. And, and uh, those, we take those two numbers to use. And then this instrument, we call it the latchet flow injection analysis. We have our water cycle samples here, our H3A samples here, and it picks the sample up, runs it through all three of these. There's three different systems there for nitrate, ammonium, and phosphorus. And, and so we run those three samples, three tests at one time going through them. It takes about a minute for each sample to go through there, so that's, it's not too bad. And then this is ICAP. Uh, the, the samples are in here. And then this thing is, uh, I don't think, yeah, I got uh, here. So ICAP, uh, there's a flame in there. Uh, I don't understand the physics of it, but you guys have heard of plasma welders? Real high temperature, uh, that's what is in that, inside of that box. And every element, as it goes through that flame, gives off light. And every element has different wavelengths of light. So we can pick the wavelengths or pick the elements that we want and the computer finds those wavelengths. And uh, we, so when we run uh, zinc, iron, manganese, copper, for example, it measures all three of those, or all four of those at one time. You go through and it takes 20 seconds to read it. So it's, it's kind, of, kind of fun instruments to use. So, so the soil health results. And Rick has an exile file that he emails out. We're doing that yet, but uh, there's five or six different pages, and it's, it's pretty kind of hard to understand. And then plant available NPK and fertilizer calculator, soil health, nitrogen, phosphorus, and the explanation sheet. And that's in your handout, that explanation sheet that he has. And here's an example. And I don't know if you guys can read this or not. Uh, this is NPK test here. And he has his uh, pounds of nitrate. And, and this is uh, pounds per acre. Pound, and P205 pounds per acre, K205 pounds per acre. And he figures out a a dollar cost here. So that's how many nutrients you have in that soil uh, based on current fertilizer prices. And then here's the grass, it's two ton yield goal. And he's recommending 71 pounds of nitrogen, 25 pounds of phosphorus, and five pounds of potash based on those readings there. And then he's, his, his requirements, he has requirements for each one of these crops. And I've seen, seen different numbers on different different tests and, and uh, so he keeps playing with these to see if he can make those look a little better. And the one that uh, uh, the Kansas guys 
saw here in wheat, 35 bushel, and they recommended 12 pounds of nitrogen and 3 pounds of phosphorus. And it only has uh, 15 pounds of phosphorus over here. And, and uh, of course, they pointed that out right away. And I, I don't know what that calculation is, but, but these are the kind of things that I'm working on trying to, trying to get this understandable with, uh, with kind of our, our normal fertilizer recommendations. But down here is corn, 90 bushel, and it needs 60 pounds of nitrogen and 45 pounds of phosphorus. But if you look over here, well, this is nine phosphorus where up here it was, uh, the wheat was uh, 15. So, but he's, he's got 45 here and three up there. So I, I, those are the kind of things that I'm having trouble with in, the, in evaluation and we'll, we'll get these things. When I get off this speaking circuit, <laughs> can sit down and kind of work on these things a little bit. But here's the soil health score, and uh, here's the sample one. The Soviet test is 75 or 76. Organic carbon is 1,000. And organic nitrogen is 49. The carbon nitrogen ratio is 20, 20, uh, uh, 21. And then the soil health test is uh, 18 or 19. Pretty good, pretty good. And, and what makes that? Remember the calculation? Uh, so VETA test divided by the carbon nitrogen ratio. And then the amount of organic carbon divided by 100, the amount of organic nitrogen divided by 10, and that was added to that. So, so we have a wide ratio, but we got really great amount of food with that, with that carbon nitrogen. And if we can get, grow a little more legume, then we could get this organic nitrogen up and, and uh, maybe even increase that score. But his cover crop mix here is 10% legume and 90% grass. And, and uh, the interesting thing is there's no turnips, radishes, just legumes. And, and I don't know if he means broad leaves or if it is just legume and grass. And that I haven't got kind of straightened out yet. Here's one down here. Sovita so is 78, carbon is 760. Nitrogen 74, carbon nitrogen ratio 10.3. Really great carbon nitrogen ratio. The health, soil health score is 22 or 20, 23, and his recommendation for cover crop is grass. So we don't want to overload the system with nitrogen, and so, so the cover crop should just be grass in that case. And now we have here, so Vita is 65 versus 78, pretty close. Organic carbon is, is way down to 334. Organic nitrogen to 32. We got we still got a good carbon nitrogen ratio. The soil health score is, is 13, and we need 30% legume and 70% grass in that case. Uh, here's one, soil health score is 7.3. And this example, that's his lowest one, and that's 60% legume. So on our farm, uh, you know, we'd probably be 80% legume on a lot of the things that I've taken samples on. Uh, just the nitrogen kind of thing, and this again in pond spray acre. And so this total nitrogen, inorganic nitrogen, and organic nitrogen. And then he, uh, he has some equation they use to calculate the organic <coughs> nitrogen availability uh, out of there. So he doesn't show all that in here. And then phosphorus, pond spray acre. And this is total P. Total P, remember, if you see that, and we're going to change these terms when we get our, we're working on a report. And of course, as all things do, you know, we're getting ready to do this, and our computer programmer uh, leaves. So we, had to, we got new ones coming in to get this work done. Total P, that's, that's the ICAP H, H3A test. The ICAP H3A, it's not, there's a lot more total P in the soil than that, but that's what he calls that. Inorganic P is the, is the one that's done with the latch at flow injection analysis, and in in he calls that the PO4 test. And organic P is the difference between those two. Here he says this is pounds per acre, and uh, he, takes, he takes the part per million times 2.3 to convert P to P205. And, and if, you, if you really do it properly, you should take it times two. And, and uh, and, and so we called him, asked him, yeah, he said, uh, I'm conservative, so I didn't do it times two. Well, 
my logic says, let's do the calculation right and then put a factor in there, your conservative factor, and make it 0.5 and you still have the same answer. But, but uh, that's, that, those are some of the things that we need to work on. And then his, his summary is, uh, how do you establish your yield goal? You're doing this nutrient assessment. He has here corn at 100 bushel. You got 1,000 acres, 100 bushel. And 100 bushel up here, in most years, he's below the yield, the yield that's less than his yield goal. And he says if you would be a little closer on that, and here he said his yield goal at 80, and some yields are above and there's some below that. And, and uh, back here he says if you do this, and the cost of the fertilizer, that's how much the crop requires, and, and you've got to put in $63,000 worth of fertilizer to get to get the 100 bushel, your chance of success is pretty low because you spent more money than you needed to for fertilizer. And of course, that, we've got to be conscious of that, the way the crop prices are right now anyway. And so here, when he set the yield goal at 80 and put the fertilizer on for 80 bushel, his cost is 44,000, 20,000 less, and his chance of success is very good. And, and he's just telling farmers that, you know, we need to, need to really properly use a set of yield goals properly in some of these things. And then he has other, other gauges and, and you know, you set and establish these, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium here, and, and get some ratings and, and, and the soil health score down here is not real good, cover crop mix is none, none there. So, so those things, maybe we can put some of that in our report too, but right now, right now I, I, have, I have a philosophy that if I give you a report and it shows that you're going to excellent. You're going to put it down and not understand, not go back and figure out why did you, why did you get an excellent score? And if I, if I say it was poor, you're going to throw it down and walk away pissed. Because, you know, so so I, I like to give you the data and let you guys look at that and study it and try to figure out what is good and bad on your own. And so so there's, there's a philosophy difference too. And, the way I've always approached. So I, I have never had low, medium, and high on my soil <coughs> test stuff. And, and uh, I get feed, feeders that call in, they want to know how their forage or their silage or their hay compares with the normal. Well, if you got bad hay, why do you need to know if it's below normal? <laughs> you gotta balance a ration. And, and if you got good hay, uh, you know, you, you should be able to look at that and know that anyway. But those, that's kind of the philosophy thing. So, and that's the end of, end of my presentation. So, you guys got any questions left? Time for some questions. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and it right, goes from 1 to 50. He said it could be above 50. But if it's above 7, you're on the right track, he said. If it's below seven, you, you've got to, uh, I think, probably work in cover crops or, or get a more diverse rotation going. And, and the corn, corn uh, bean rotation, uh, and, and I put wheat in every fourth year, and we still don't have very good scores. And, and so, so the fertilization practices that we're doing, we may, may have to start figuring out how to cut that back a little bit. And that's what, what Rick done on the, like on the nitrogen, he, he uses, in my example, a 0.9 pound of nitrogen per bushel. Well, Gellerman's using 1.2, 1, 1 I think, and we're using, what changed mine this fall to 1.1. <laughs> so he's, right away, he's got, he's got a lower nitrogen requirement than what we have. And so that's part of that thing. And then he includes ammonium in that, and so that makes his recommendation lower than any organic nitrogen, but he doesn't include subsoil nitrate, which we, you know, and, and Gellerman you know, supports that. So, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, this is just one of those things that it's, it's a new evaluation. Rick has developed a test. We have two, three laboratories in the country now. Uh, Woods End Laboratory up in Maine, uh, uh, the lab in Ohio, and then us are the three that are doing it right now. And, and we're charging $49.50 for the test. Rick said we should charge 50 bucks. And I didn't really want to make the price $49.99. So we dropped it to 49.50. It sounds cheaper than 50 bucks, uh, and that includes the three tests, and that's the lead test. A lot of labs are charging 
20 bucks just for the Solvita test.